Hello, Comrade Net. This is the first time that we're doing this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the first time that we're doing this. Okay, uh, me, uh, I'm, uh, I don't know, I've been called various things. AV was my uh, first name, uh, but that's, uh, you know, a boy's name. Abraham is actually my name. My full name, whoa. Abraham Yechesko, which is uh, Ezekiel in English. Weisfeld, Goldscheider, very Jewish name, huh? Goldscheider, that's very Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Goldscheider means the one who cuts gold or who uh, works as a jeweler, you know, with gold jewelry. That's what the whole uh, Jewish ghetto was based off on, you know, was this little shop industry, you know, the economy was basically uh, very archaic. And uh, except for the brush factory, the brush factory in Warsaw, you know, had uh, hundreds of workers and they made brushes for everybody. They were so good at it that it was exported. <laughs> it was a site of resistance as well against the uh, Nazi occupation. So my mother, yeah, she escaped uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto because her brother, elder brother, set up an underground railway into the... Uh, Soviet Union Russian forests across the border, which you had to get to by walking and without a passport, of course, <laughs> which is has its consequences because nowadays I applied for the recognition of my Polish citizenship under the uh, right of return law that was passed by the Polish government. And they were asking for a passport of my parents. <laughs> How would you get that? Uh... Off you know, like I, I had to explain to them, you know, that, you know, passports were not issued for Jewish people, you know, under Nazi occupied Poland, as if I had to explain this, you know. That's um, incredible. It got worse. It got worse. Net, it got worse, you know, because then, you know, I offered the proof of my father's birth, you know, uh, written, handwritten in, in script, you know, with one of those, you know, plumes, you know, like a feathers, you know, with the, with the ink, you know, flowing out. Yeah, of the yeah. It was written in this uh, family register or, you know, in, in the, in the uh, shtetl that he lived in, in Bielki, that he was born on a certain date. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, this I offered as proof that he was born in Poland. And they said, well, that's not enough proof that he was a citizen because, you see, the, the theocratic state of Poland did not recognize Jewish people even if they were born in Poland, as citizens, because citizens was something else. What was it? What's the definition of a citizen under the you know, Polish nation state at the time? Christianity. So now I'm fighting that. I'm fighting the whole theocratic definition of the Polish state. And I'm waiting you know, from the governor of Warsaw to reply to my application after years and years of work. How are you doing? Oh. You know, coming from you, that's a good question because, like, I, I go to the store all the time. They say it, and I say, please don't ask me the question. I'm so inconsiderate that people ask strangers how they're doing. <laughs> but I'm glad we're no strangers. But I'm, I'm um, optimistic. I haven't been optimistic in a while, but I'm, I'm kind of in like deeper <laughs> shit for a long time. Uh, but it's um. I'm optimistic for decent reasons. There's there's things coming. We've seen certain progress, haven't we? Yes, it's wonderful to be surrounded, you know, by such such a supportive, you know, comrades. It really makes uh, you know all the difference in the world. Yeah. 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 So we're engaged in building the uh, United International Intercommunalist Convergence, and it's big. You know, <laughs> the name is big. You know, because uh, you know the network is big. Yeah, um, a, a lot of people uh, are, are like, like you get through the MRM network and when they explain that people are still so confused. And so like uh, maybe maybe um, people will know more when they get word of what we're saying. By the time by the time this gets around to the right people, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. Or they're just or, 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 or they're just I don't know. Like the thing is, is like it's hard to tell. It's hard to take feedback on the Internet. Seriously, I'll put it that way particularly on YouTube, particularly on YouTube. Uh, but, um, it, you know, but I think that that's the thing. It, it's not about, you know, the, you know, 
the media, we got to remember that it's about the outreach. And yes, the outreach can be repressed, but it can't be if you're astute enough to put it in the correct direction. You know, you just have to know the demographics. Right now, mm. right now, I think the United, I, I, I typically refer to it as, by the shorter term, United Intercommunalist Convergence. Right now, um, it's getting most recognition, um, I've noted, I, from what I've learned, um, currently in the sectors that are the poorest and particularly we're talking about like the ghettos of, uh, you know, uh, California. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a large presence of this in Arizona, but Arizona is in a, in a chaos. So, mm -hmm. well, it's pretty well, you know, been uh, building, uh, internally for quite a while and it's, uh, about to, uh, become, uh, very public, you know, with the, uh, collection, uh, that we call the manual, the manual of revolution with the, Writings of the Martyred Comrades of uh, May 27th, uh, 2019. And uh, uh, we're making their work count and also proving their existence uh, and their individuality as well. So, and this exposes the whole nature of the police force there, which has denied the massacre, you know, all along because they're accomplices. And uh, this uh, <clears throat> will... Uh, we have to make a breakthrough in this in this domain here. Yeah. So we've come together today, you know, to talk about, uh, first of all, what Bundism is. Because it's causing a bit of a commotion, you know, it's upsetting people, you know, so we have to explain it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that, it's not hard to explain, but to explain its place in history, I think is hard to explain. I know certain details that are obscure about it, but like, I wouldn't know like the broad history the way you would. Or the way Don and Newman would even. Like, I'm not a good Buddhist historian, but what I do pick up on was that the Buddhists were not sectarian. That's what's so funny. It's like everybody was always sectarian towards us, the anarchists, the Marxists. We probably got better with the anarchists, I think, historically. Uh, good question. I don't know. I don't know about that. But uh, the sectarianism of both the uh, Mensheviks. And what became the Bolsheviks in beginning in 1903 even is uh, remarkable, you know, like why weaken the revolutionary movement by expelling the Jewish Bund, which represented 38,000, you know, revolutionary socialists who were Jewish, happened to be Jewish, you know, and they identified as Jewish and they joined a Jewish organization because the Polish Socialist Party, you know, was majority, you know, Christians and also wasn't revolutionary. So, you know, they had to resort to building their own organization, their own unions, because Christian employers did not, did not employ Jewish employees. So uh, Jewish workers, you know, had to go to Jewish employers, you know, to get any work. So they ended up with their own union as well, you know, because all the workers were, were Jewish, you know, for all of those different uh, employers. So it became like a parallel uh, a parallel society, a Jewish society, Jewish civil society within Polish civil society and elsewhere as well. And it's continued to be that, even though there's been, you know, transformations of class configurations and all that. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the Jewish civil society has continued. And the Jewish Bundes position is that this civil society requires its own national cultural autonomy requires the recognition, requires, requires a representation. We cannot be ignored anymore. <clears throat> Just because, you know, the Marxists say that we're uh, irrelevant and that we don't count. I even heard this, you know, said about the Jewish people. You know, I was in the uh, Quebec Solidaire Party here in Quebec, you know, which was founded initially by revolutionary socialist, uh, uh, whose name is... Uh, Rose, Paul Rose, actually. And uh, uh, when I first came here to uh, Montreal, you know, in 1986, you know, that's what uh, became the uh, the movement now, which has 10 seats in the National Assembly and is quite well known. It's practically the official opposition. And it was started, you know, by a group of us, you know, in the uh, Quebec and uh, Social Democratic Formation, the NDP, which was, had a membership, you know, of uh, revolutionary socialists. So we quit the NDP, we quit the, the, the National um, Social Democratic Party, set up our own formation. 
and uh, Party of Democratic Socialism, I think it was called. And uh, and it, it grew and be infused, you know, with the feminist movement at the time to become, you know, this uh, big movement now. And I was the candidate in uh, in the West Montreal uh, area. And I was, you know, promoting the Jewish Bund there. And <clears throat> each election, you know, got, you know, started with about a thousand votes and then moved to a thousand three hundred votes. And then they decided, you know, that uh, I wasn't doing well enough, you know, because I was talking about Palestine. So uh, all the pro-Zionist people were not going to vote for me. So they wanted to find a candidate who would be neutral or wouldn't mention Palestine. So they found this ex -ND peer. Uh, um, and we had, and then they pushed through her nomination without my even being allowed to into the, uh, into the hall. <laughs> I was just told to get lost first time. So I made a complaint. <clears throat> they held another nomination procedure again because they, it was evidently, you know, illegal. And then I said, you know, look, you know, like, isn't it logical to, you know, have a Jewish candidate, you know, when 35% of the population is Jewish in the writing. And then she gets up, you know, to refute me and she says, the Jews are only 19,500. They don't count. And nobody said anything. It was just sort of accepted as, you know, normal sort of, you know, thing. And this was supposed to be the most, you know, left-wing party in the Quebec, you know, political culture. So, you know, like, I didn't want to sort of cause a commotion. I should have, you know, I should have risen on a point of order and asked for her expulsion. But, uh, you know, they didn't understand, you know, what anti-Semitism is, you know, and how someone can get away with saying something like that. So I ran in the election against her as an independent <laughs> and destroyed her campaign. <laughs> So she got about only about 1,200 votes, and I got about 335 votes. So there's 335 Bundes in that one riding in Western Montreal. <laughs> and then the, the Jewish press, you know, the Zionist the Jewish press, <clears throat> Canadian Jewish News, they always freaked out, you know, when I was running as a candidate. And so they would re report on, you know, how few votes I was getting, you know, but so what, you know, like <laughs> even 335, you know, of us in one writing, you know, is magnificent. So <clears throat> that's why they had to report about it. So that's, you know, like what the uh, Bundism is, you know, that we actually uh, do represent uh, Jewish people and uh, not, you know, uh, be a Jewish people who are assimilated into a Marxist milieu who call upon the Jewish people to stop being Jewish. Basically, you know, Marx's uh, 19, 1848 pamphlet on the on the Jewish question. He said the fault of uh, anti-Semitism is the Jewish people themselves and that the anti-Semitism would disappear <clears throat> if the Jewish people disappeared. Not in a physical sense, but in a cultural sense that you're supposed to pa you know, assimilate by passing into uh, German society. And this was you know, the ambition of all the middle-class you know, German Jewish people because you know the working class had left already to go to Poland, and uh, what was less left was mainly the petty bourgeoisie, and this was what seemed to impress uh, Karl Marx the most. And so he made you know many mistakes, you know, when it came to discussing you know Jewish people, the Jewish uh, Jewish nation, basically Jewish people, you know, exist you know in various countries, and so all in all, you know, we were a Jewish nation on an international level, different kind of a nation. We're a diaspora nation, um, yeah, uh, and a people nation, but we are particularly a diaspora nation, if, you know, in the most uh, materialist uh, sense of the word, yeah. I would say. Yeah. But we were, um, we're <sighs> one thing that I've uh, uh, done my best to do is to figure out what the common strand of Jewish people are, because. I've known Jewish atheists and Jewish agnostics like yourself, and I've and there's nothing that gives me any incentive to say, well, they're not Jewish anymore. So I've often had to look deeper, and that's that's why I embrace the Demarchist theory because it makes this it makes the statement that religiosity itself is a matter of orientation, and you know, like it was started by a, a Christian atheist. So, you know, like like he 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 had a way of explaining how he was actually a Christian but also an atheist. So. When I saw how that worked, that actually was perfect cannon fodder also towards people that claimed that Jewish ethnicity existed or that Jewish race existed, you know, yet there's that problem of ethnicity, 
um, with Sephardim, Ashkenazi, Mizrahim, and other groups that are considered ethnically Jewish. And, and you know, when you look at it, it's not that they're ethnically Jewish. They are predominantly Jewish historically, and you can point to other people. Like, there's a focus on the Jew. That's the problem with anti-Semitism. There's a focus on the Jew. And there wouldn't be a focus on the Jew if there had never been Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't mean Christianity, because it's not necessarily innately Christian itself, but it is a opposition sorry, innately Jewish, but it is an opposition to Judaism from the start, regardless of what, you know, because it's, it, it, it's a break off, you know, but it's not just a break off. It's one that is um, infected with, I don't mean to be crude about that, but you know, I mean, it's infected with immediate Hellenistic ideas from the start. You're always looking for this pure Christianity. When you, there is no pure Christianity. You look at the history, there was a movement in Galilee. Jesus was one part of it. We don't know much about this guy. We know a lot of stuff got attributed to him. And, you know, then they wrote the Gospels years, 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 years later. And that's it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, I mean, that in itself, you know, is uh, can be a point of critique, you know, to what is considered to be Orthodox Christianity by the West, because the West transformed, you know, the Gospels <clears throat> when the uh, Roman Empire uh, I forget the uh, emperor's name, F F Flavius, I think his name was, who rewrote the Gospels to predict that he was going to come into existence and be the, the great master or something or other. He gave himself a title, a theocratic title, and then proclaimed, you know, the, his Christianity to be the state, um, you know, religion of the Roman, Roman Empire. And that's how the Holy Ro Roman Empire came to be. And su subsequently, you know, the, the Crusades in order to destroy any other, you know, sect of Christianity in order to, you know, proclaim its hegemony over all the Christianity and over all of the world, in effect. Because <clears throat> Jerusalem is supposed to be the center of the world, and if you control Jerusalem, you know, then you control the world, that type of thinking in an ideological terms. Ideology plays such an important role, you know, like in the current war <clears throat> in the Ukraine, you know, it's an ideological war. It's not an economic war. It's not a, you know, not an oil sort of, you know, like based, you know, seeking war like the others in the Middle East. Uh, it's it's the ideological war, you know, the sanctions and all of that sort of stuff. It's incredible. And it uh, points to the last stand, you know, the I would Al argue Alamo of the American empire. <laughs> well, I, 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 mean, no, I agree, but I would argue there is a strong... Uh economic underline that you can't avoid and that's when all else fails land is always valuable so this is about land this is about land domination you know who who has a right to property ultimately and mm -hmm. you know equal exchange is a threat to people who would lose the privilege so then one bothers to ask the question well if everybody's going to be equal what's the threat to lose and I, I would say control a lot of people would say you know wealth yeah but wealth is about control control of yourself and then you want control over everything else and you know that that's where it comes what it comes down to is control mm -hmm. that's, know, what this, think... uh, that's what the zionists you know think that's how the zionists think you know it's all a matter of control for them that you know that they the ultimate you know like uh principle for which they're fighting and dying and killing for is a nation state that's what they think is a solution to the uh, to the plight of jewish people in history but it represents a form of assimilation, you know, to the Protestant nation state concept like Europe. So it's trying yeah. to recreate Europe in the Orient. It's well, particularly neocolonialism, which I still argue is actually worse than colonialism itself, because it takes uh, the marginalized and turns them into uh, vicious people. That's my contention, by the way, with Turkish nationalism and Rojava as a whole. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, while there's empathy for Rojava on the grounds that there's no national cultural autonomy for the uh, Kurds, the Kurds are brainwashed on mass i'm not saying every single one but the majority of them from what and i've met a lot of decent kurdish people they're lar they're largely obsessed with the nation state concept mm. they, they are trying to deny their connection to um the turkish which is yeah i understand that there's a true animosity that the turks did to the kurds but the kurds are of the turk world always were mm. you know there's a lot of denial that i find frustrating yeah so, through them you know and and the, you can take a kurdish nationalist and a zionist and it will be very difficult to tell the difference uh -huh. that's precisely the problem with zionism is trying to implement you know a european you know construct of a nation state by the prussian hegel 
into you know the orient you know where there's you know plurinational societies everywhere you know there's not one nation predominantly majoritarian you know that is uh, one nation you know we, all of the nations are nationalities they're all minorities <laughs> and they you know all live together you know so you cannot and then there's the tribes you know which go into making each nation as well you know like it's a very complex structure so <clears throat> You cannot, you know, impose a nation state, you know, into that area. And that's what Zionism is all about. And even declared itself as such, you know, a couple of years ago. So, you know, the Bund has always argued, you know, that this is not the way to go. That the way to go is to stop fascists, you know, where it, where it, uh, where it originates, you know, in the countries of residence, you know, where Jewish people live and where the Roma people live. You know, the fascism has to be defeated. It's not entirely defeated. You know, the Red Army defeated the fascism you know in its in its uh, strongest form after it was supported you know by all of the west and yet it defeated the nazism but the west adopted the, the nazis you know after the war you know because the red army had become so strong and so you know they sought to That's rebuild to uh, basically in slow motion, they would, you know, start to rebuild, you know, what the Nazis were doing, you know, and NATO is here, you know, and coming and coming and coming, you know, where's it going to stop? It's not going to stop unless it stopped. It didn't stop after the Cold War. And there, it's like the West has tried to force a new Cold War, uh, but it's not a real Cold War because it's not an ideology war anymore. It's just land. It's just, it's, it's really just Americanism versus everybody else. Mm. And Americanism includes whatever, uh, you know, pact that they have in NATO. Mm. Okay, so we have 10 more minutes uh, be because we're limited by time because we don't have a premium edition, of course. Oh. <laughs> so the, the other question that flows from the Jewish Bund is uh, the Jewish ident identity, you know, because the Jewish Bund uh, created a Jewish identity, you know, which hadn't existed before. Before it was a theocratic identity. The rabbis were the head of the community. Or, you know, some sort of imposed, you know, Jewish, you know, mayor uh, by the yes. uh, state in which he was living. But yes, but the Bund would, came I, along. Yes, but I would argue the flaw with the old Bund is it relied on secularism, which is basically the, the, next, the, the, the higher stage of Christian theocracy, uh, regardless, yeah. of what, regardless of what your religion is, actually. And, I, and that's why I oppose secularism in any form. Yes. I, it's a big misnomer because what you're looking for is something that it transcends interfaith and even non-believers together in democracy. Yes. But yeah. what the boon, but what 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 was trade of I would say though to the credit though of the old boon was that what they did see was that there was something beyond just the religion. And I think that that was the culture that they recognized. Yes. Yeah, Yiddishkeit. Yeah, and the Yiddish language, yes. And all the uh, cultural institutions that were set up. And the children's movement as well. Yes, it was wonderful. You know, huge movement, you know, of Jewish, you know, revolutionary socialists. And they were all killed by the Nazis. And that's why they were killed is because they were revolutionary socialists. It's an ideological war that's being waged upon the Jewish people because the Jewish people were more, had a greater propensity, you know, to adopt revolutionary socialism because they were more oppressed. So they were killed because they didn't have any solution to the because they, you know, they, you know, they weren't social democrats, you know, so they didn't have a right to live. It's interesting these days because the younger, uh, especially with the millennials and now even more so with the Zoomers, a lot of young Jewish people um, like being Jewish. They, mm. they, they, they'll literally study, they'll literally go through orthodox reform, uh, conservative reconstructions just to experiment to see which one they like. Like this is a big thing happening. They're going back into the synagogues mm. and asking where are the yeshivas and everything like that. And these same people often are very turned off thanks to the BDS and the Jewish Voice for Peace propaganda networks. They become very turned off to Zionism uh -huh. as a result of, of both BDS and and uh, JVP. Yeah. yeah. And but a lot of them are angry and they look at it and like, okay, yeah, that's nice. Uh, boycott sanctions and everything. Okay, whatever. That's nice. Jewish board through speech. And, and they look at, okay, we're being outshouted by Marxists and anarchists. You know, maybe we need to stop being center left crap and go far left. And, but that's the dangerous part. Once the boom went far left recently, which it should have, you know, um, a long time ago, but like, I mean, and, and there was a time in its history when it was far left, I would say, particularly in the 30s and 40s. Um, 
Yes, and in, in Eastern Europe. But in, uh, in the West, where the Jewish Bund, you know, was set up by the immigrants, of course, their children did not follow through. Yeah. And they didn't, they yeah. didn't, they weren't activists and they were intimidated by the Zionists and they never spoke in public. They were yeah. afraid. You know, the Zionists, uh, you know, carried on a campaign of fear mongering amongst, you know, the Jewish refugees, even in, in the refugee camps, you know, where my father told me the Zionists would come in and try to recruit people to go to the Palestine to, to be soldiers and fight against the Palestinians and the British, but more so against the Palestinians. And, uh, and those, you know, that uh, argued back, you know, Bundes, and uh, you know, tried to stop their, <clears throat> their recruiting, you know, will argue against it, they were beaten up. Refugees beaten up by the Zionist agents, you know, came into the Jewish refugee camps. It was a, it's a war, you know, between Bundism and Zionism. In fact, you know, one of the uh, first anti-Zionists, uh, De Ha from the uh, Netherlands, was assassinated by the Zionists, you know, because he was such a threat. He was a Zionist previously and prominent and a brilliant illiterist. And he was assassinated, you know, as others have been, like Yitzhak Rabin, you know, for, for not even being anti-Zionist. It's incredible, you know, the Zionist movement is a very <clears throat> quasi-fascist movement, you know. And in the West Bank, you know, there are overt fascists, you know, who organize as gangs and come to attack Palestinians, Palestinian farmers. And of course, you know, they seek to expand on the private Palestinian lands. They don't go to empty lands, you know, like somewhere, you know, like on a hill, you know, like far away from a Palestinian village. No, they go to a hill, you know, that's the closest to a Palestinian village or city. Like Nablus is practically surrounded, you know, by Zionist colonies. And it's a big problem that has to be dealt with. Yeah. I would argue, by the way, that um, while a lot of Zionism is quasi-fascist, I'd say that when you're talking about Pahanism, though, that is officially fascist. Yeah. And then it's officially fascist, like the way that they operate. They have the audacity to say that they, like, Kahana had the audacity to say he was inspired by the Panthers. Yeah. But you know, with the with the Bundist movement that start from the start of 20, uh, this, sorry, 2009, um, that's when the Bund started taking in the Pantherite way of looking at this. Mm. You know, like, that's the first, in fact, Jewish application officially to Pantherhood by, by seeing, you know, oh, Panthers, Rainbow Coalition, us, United Front, Boone, Warsaw. In fact, reference to Warsaw in the Ten Point, you know, like mm. it clicked to a lot of uh, people, mm -hmm. you know, but it scares people, including communists. Not all communists, though. Like a lot of the Maoists have warmed up on us, but the radical anarchists tend to agree with us on certain things. Not everything, though. And then then, then, then this is getting other uh, Jewish people who are Buddhists to, to consider Maoism and anarchism, you know, and not just the thing that you know, we developed since 2009 between you and me and Donna. <laughs> yeah, there's many, many different kinds of Buddhists as well, you know, like we're not yeah. ideologically fixated, you know, so we sort of, you know, demonstrate how we can unite the left because we unite, you know, J Jewish people of various, you know, um, political theories, anarchism, Maoism. Not so much Trotskyism. I mean, I was a Trotskyist for a long time, you know, from 66 to 76, you know, but the Trotskyist movement, you know, never sort of came to adopt uh, a, uh, a, a Bundist conception of what the Jewish people are, even though Trotsky did in 1937, when he declared that Jewish people are a nation, will remain a nation, and, with, and have their national rights uh, to be taken into consideration. But he didn't use the Bundist formulation of national cultural autonomy. He didn't mention the Bund. <laughs> he didn't mention that he was that's, that's exactly uh, adopting. He would, he would water stuff down a lot. He would. He would take a good idea, he'd water it down, or even turn it on his head. I mean, he was brilliant, but he. Yeah. Like, Yo, man, like, <laughs> yeah, but he was trying to build, you know, like a, a democratic centralist organization and he had to be the leader, you know, so he couldn't, you know, say that anybody else, you know, was, a, was providing him with any ideas. No, he had to be the inspiration himself, <laughs> the prophet. <laughs> yeah, very good, you know. <laughs> he, you know, he would actually study psychology and he would wear the leather jacket to intimidate people that were anti-Semitic because they actually believed that we were devils. Oh, <laughs> you know, in Quebec, you know, the Catholic Church used to teach, you know, the, the students in the, in the Catholic schools, 
that the Jewish people had horns, you know. <laughs> I <laughs> remember you telling me about that. Damn. Little horns, you know, and then that's when they wear hats, you know, to cover the horns. <laughs> Yo, like I could have holes in my shoes because I'm actually very poor typically. And, you know, like I get asked for loans on the street randomly, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I, I first first thing is I was like, how, how would you even know I'm Jewish? And it's like it's 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 in your walk. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I'm being ousted as Jewish, which is not a, not nothing I'm ashamed of, but I ain't tell you that, you know. So what the hell? <laughs> but uh, you know, like uh, we we fight back. Here here's my pious. I'll I'll braid it. You know, like I have pious. I've kept them. So uh, and and I've got a beard too. You know, so I can be a rabbi. I, I do too, but I'm black blocked and I I have to be as low key as i possibly can well yeah some people connect the dots some people don't when they connect the dots i get really worried because some people know who i w w which places i live at no need to talk about that so okay this has been a good session i think that uh, they're about to sort of you know cut, uh, cut us off you know because we're going over time but this is a good time anyway to uh, to stop right now and then continue later on with discussion of Jewish identity and uh, how to fight anti-Semitism and what to fight anti-Semitism with in uh, the United States of America and elsewhere and uh, and how to take on Zionism and uh, what uh, what we need to do here and in Palestine as well. Very good. Okay, bye for now. Down with Zionism and down with Americanism. Down with Americanism.